All right, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody to our Hutch at Home series. Um, I'm Jeannie Chowning and I direct the Science Education Partnership at Fred Hutch. I'm also Senior Director of Science Education and this is our way of bringing some of the exciting research that's happening at Fred Hutch um, to your home. And we have teachers here from our um, Science Education Partnership Program, as well as other interested teachers. Um, we also have some students present. Um, and I'm just delighted that you're all here with us today um, for this special talk, Can Bacteria Cause Cancer? And i um, very excited to have Dr. Nina Salama join us. And she's a professor of human biology, public health sciences, and um, the basic sciences division at Fred Hutch. And before we get started, just a quick reminder to please mute yourself if not talking. Um, feel free to add your questions into the chat. Uh, we may have some pauses where we take a look at the questions um, as they're coming up or uh, address them towards the end. But um, at any time, feel free to put your questions in there. And we do have a feedback form at the end of the talk, or you can feel free to just um, email us some feedback or put the feedback into the chat as well. We're always interested in your thoughts about this program and um, how we can make better in the future. All right, and um, I already uh, mentioned that um, Dr. Salama is a faculty member at Fred Hutch, and really it's, it's interesting how many divisions uh, her work spans. It really, it, you know, it's a testament to how applicable um, this is for so many different areas of biology. Um, also, uh, the Peterson Memorial Chair for Lymphoma Research and um, the director of the molecular and cellular biology or mcb graduate program at fred hutch and in this capacity um, dr salama and i have also partnered to think about how we can help graduate students learn a little bit about um, best practices in teaching and learning and science communication so then they can participate in some of the teacher and student programs that we have at fred hutch and they get alternate um, science TA education credits for that. And so that's a pretty innovative program, I think, that Fred Hutch has to um, encourage future scientists to also think about education. And so she has a passion for education as well. I really appreciate, appreciate that and appreciate working with her. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over uh, and stop sharing my screen and invite her to share hers. And that's uh, I'll welcome Dr. Salama. Great. Um, I, I just uh, went ahead and turned off my video because um, it was kind of breaking up a little bit for me. Um, as soon as you give me permission to share my screen. Oh, they changed the, they changed the features here. So hang on just a second. I have to go. Okay. Should work now. Okay. Let me try that. Uh, let's see if that works. Oops, there we go. Share. Mm -hmm. Can you see yes. the yeah. PowerPoint? Look great. Mm -hmm. it, can you see my pointer? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So we'll 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 go with that. Um, so um, uh, so I'm really delighted to be able to to speak to this group about um, about uh, a bacteria that causes cancer, and I'm actually going to kind of flip it around a bit and actually talk about how a cancer causing bacteria has shaped my um, career because th that's sort of the, the, the nature of how, how this talk is, is going to go. And as, as, um, as Jeannie said, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take um, questions at the end and you can put them in the chat. And also, if, if something is confusing along the way, I actually don't mind if you unmute yourself and, and, um, and, and ask me a question too. I'm, I'm actually quite fine with that. So I thought um, it might be nice to just start off with what my path is uh, in, in science and how I, I actually got to come to the Hutch. And, and it starts but I was actually born in um, in Cairo, Egypt, and um, uh, 
But then I emigrated with my family when I was only one and a half to the U.S. And we landed in Illinois. And um, more specifically in Peoria, Illinois, which is kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, uh, I think its most famous industry might be Caterpillar, the uh, company that, that makes the big farm equipment. Um, so um, my father actually was a, a surgeon, a thoracic surgeon, but coming to the States, he, um, he needed to redo residency. Um, and so he had to find a residency program uh, to, to do that. And, um, and he ended up having two options, one in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, and then this other one in Peoria. And um, I actually have an identical twin sister. And so we were babies and they decided that Peoria would be kind of the safer place to, to, to raise two little kids compared to Philadelphia. But then after my dad completed his residency, we actually moved north to a little town that's actually uh, too small to be on this map, but it's on the Rock River, kind of between Rockford and Rock Island, right about here, called Sterling, Illinois. And that's actually where I, um, I grew up. So in the middle of the cornfields, there's actually a big steel mill in, in our town that was the big industry. So it was kind of people that worked in the steel mill or were farmers. Um, so, uh, I uh, went to college at the big state school, which is University of Illinois, which is in the center of the state in, state in Champaign-Urbana. It was really when I was at um, Illinois that I kind of got my first taste of the research enterprise, because I was interested in biology, but you know, kind of growing up in a small town, the, the only thing I thought that you could do with biology was to be a doctor like my dad, which I actually did not want to want to do. Um, but while I was in Illinois, I realized that there was this whole research enterprise. And then actually I had my first research experience with a summer program at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And so that's where I first got my eyes open to the research enterprise. And so after that, I came when I came back to, um, so this was the summer after my sophomore year, and then um, I decided to um, start doing undergrad re research at University of Illinois. And that put me in a position to apply to graduate school. And that's when I came west. So I did my um, graduate work at UC Berkeley um, in California. And um, uh, as I'll talk about in a second, I, I um, worked in pretty fundamental cell biology. And um, and then, um, so that was in the, um, uh, I started in 1989 uh, into the mid-90s. And, um, and uh, at that time, funding for science was actually pretty low. And um, while I loved this fundamental basic science, I kind of felt like I needed to, to move into something that was a little bit more applied. And um, I, my interest was picked uh, in, uh, in the study of bacterial pathogens. And so I moved across the bay to Stanford University, um, where that's where I actually started my work on Helicobacter. And, um, and then after I um, uh, completed my postdoc, uh, this my first job was actually here at the Hutch. So um, uh, as, as my dad always tells me, you know, I was already well into my 30s before I had my first real job. And, um, and it was pretty amazing to go from, you know, being a student or a lowly postdoc to suddenly having a lab on the third floor of the Hutchinson building overlooking Lake Union. So this was pretty much my, I would have to say my dream job. And, um, and basically I've been at the Hutch ever since. So I joined in 2001. So how did, you know, this seems like almost an incredible journey to, to go from this little town in, um, in the northwest corner of Illinois to make it to this, this beautiful spot with this state-of-the-art lab. So, you know, I mean, I think I can't really emphasize enough how important my mentors were to me along the way. And um, I've kind of listed all of them here, and I'm going to focus a little bit more earlier because of the audience that, that I'm in on, on kind of the early part of, of the journey. So obviously my family was really important. As I mentioned, my dad um, is a physician. Uh, he's now a retired pathologist. And my mother um, actually is a retired nurse. So they both were 
part of the biomedical enterprise, but, um, but really in my, uh, my sister, this is my twin and I, um, fostered a love of, of science and not necessarily of medicine, but just questioning the world uh, around us. And, um, and then I had some really impactful teachers in both middle, middle school and high school. So um, Mr. Greider was my um, math teacher in um, junior high and um, in, in seventh grade. But I actually met him uh, when I was in elementary school because, uh, you know, go, I was going to this, you know, small elementary school and, you know, just kind of going along. And apparently we had taken some standardized tests and my parents, particularly my dad, freaked out about how bad my sister and I's math scores were, which they attributed to, you know, uh, possibly not getting sufficient instruction. And so they made us go to a summer math camp, which, you know, when this was proposed to us seemed like the absolute worst thing in the world that, um, that one could do. But it was taught by Mr. Greider uh, in, in the basement of one of our local churches. And he just made it incredibly fun. Um, so we learned about, you know, different, uh, uh, different concepts in math in a sort of very creative way that, that made, them, made it a lot of fun and made me go from not liking math to, to liking math. And then fast forward to, um, to junior high when, um, when I was in his, I, I think the pre-algebra class or something like that. Um, I just thought I was the, the cat's meow when it came to math to the point that I, whenever he would ask a question in class, I would always blurt out the answer, not giving anybody else a chance such that, um, you know, I think maybe even during the first week of class, he actually dragged my myself in my little desk and shoved me out in the hallway such that um, so that other students would have a chance to answer some of these questions, which was, of course, mortifying, particularly because, you know, it's a small town, not that big of a school by like already by the next period, one of the, you know, eighth graders was was chiding me about being kicked out of Mr. Greider's class. So that was kind of embarrassing, but, but, you know, basically he didn't be confident in math. And I think that was um, what really helped me throughout the rest of my career. And then another key teacher was my um, high school biology teacher, Ms. Christensen, who was just uh, phenomenal. And uh, so I had her freshman year, but I lo loved her class so much that I took uh, the, like uh, the honors biology uh, my senior year. And here again, that was really kind of what got me um, into uh, majoring in biology in, in college. And so, you know, these, these two teachers really had a profound uh, influence on me. And, and, and they also instilled enough um, rigor, even though, you know, I was in this small school, no AP classes, but when I got to U of I, I was actually um, still able to test out of um, most of calculus and you know, get into the accelerated chemistry. And that actually got me um, on course to join Carol Muster's honors biology program, which only had, um, you know, I'm at University of Illinois, this, this enormous school, but it only had 30 students. And that's really what got me interested in research and got me on the path to doing undergraduate research programs and, 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 and moving on. And then I had, you know, really great mentors in graduate school during my postdoc. And then it just hasn't stopped. I mean, you know, even now I um, count a number of really fantastic people at the, at the Hutch, at the University of Washington, that have really um, kind of kept me going and, and advocating. So, so, you know, mentors just have been important along the way. And they've been important um, both as inspiration but also in really instilling me the, the important parts of sort of the fun of, of the community of science and how science is always better as you collaborate. And that's gonna be kind of become a theme for the, for the rest of the talk. So as I mentioned <clears throat> earlier, I did my graduate work at UC Berkeley on really fundamental cell biology. And the problem that I was studying was um, how proteins move within the cell, how they get 
from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus. And I did this using um, yeast as a model system, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And actually the, the specific gene that I worked on was a gene called SEC31. And so, um, so you know, I always joke that I worked on sex because sex for secretion mutants. Um, and, and I really loved uh, my grad, graduate project because I got to do cell biology, biochemistry, and genetics all together. And um, it was just a really exciting time to be in, the, in, in that lab. Um, Randy actually went on to get the Nobel Prize for some of this work. And so like one of my papers is cited in, in his Nobel address, which is, so it was just a just incredibly rewarding time to be in, the, in that lab. But then as I was thinking about what I wanted to do in my career, you know, um, I, I, I didn't necessarily want to stay in the system because there was a lot of great people working on it. And I, I kind of felt like the, the pro, the, where that problem was, was getting into, the, you know, some very nitty gritty. And I, I kind of wanted to, to explore something a little bit more open-ended. And um, I actually just happened to go to a, a seminar um, that was about cell biology, but it had a couple of speakers that were talking about bacterial pathogens. And I came to realize that, um, that when bacteria infect hosts, one of the ways that they're able to set up shop in, in their hosts is to um, manipulate the cell biology of the of host cells to their own end, and just that concept I found you know really fascinating, and so I decided that 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 was the area that I I wanted to go into, and I started um, writing. Yeah, I, so the interesting thing about that is is that um, at the, at that time that I was at Berkeley. They, they're, they had actually kind of decimated their microbiology department. They had done a big reorganization and disbanded microbiology um, uh, and, and several years later kind of built it back up. But, but at the time that I was there, there wasn't a lot of microbiology on campus. And so, um, so basically I kind of started reading and writing to people elsewhere throughout the country um, uh, to, to talk about moving into this new field. And I originally thought I was going to work on diarrheal pathogens until I went to interview at Stanford and got introduced to Helicobacter pylori. And, um, and I was um, so engaged with, um, with the story of H. pylori that I decided to, to move in this direction. And that's because during my interview, I had heard that H. pylori um, uh, causes ulcers but it turns out that it also can cause cancer. And um, a lot of people don't realize that, um, that um, about 15% of cancers are actually attributed to infectious agents. And then when we think about um, uh, causes of cancer, we often think about viruses like human papilloma virus. But it turns out that um, uh, gastric cancers um, account for actually the largest fraction of, um, of infection associated cancers and they're, and they're caused by a bacteria. And so you can kind of see that put another way by this pie graph, which is you know, basically looking at the infectious agents that cause these various cancer associated pathogens. And you can see that um, while um, most cancers, uh, infectious cancers are caused by viruses, by single agent, Helicobacter pylori is actually the winner of this bacterium. Now, um, when we think about how a bacteria um, uh, causes cancer, one of the things that's um, kind of vexing is, is what is labeled here as the, is the 70 to one problem. So um, basically 70% of, of people harbor infection that could cause cancer, but less than 1% of those actually get cancer. So how is it that, that one goes from infection to cancer? And you know, it's a little bit like this, this cartoon here. Don't just sit there looking all precancerous um, with your exposure to UV light. So, so there's a primary infection that, um, that can lead to chronic infection or replication and, and, and then progression to cancer. And, um, and one of the things that's, that's really interesting about about this kind of you know long pathway is that it also prevents um, multiple points for interventions to prevent cancer. So for example, if you have a vaccine that can prevent the primary infection, then of course you're not you're not going to get that cancer. 
And then there's also sort of um, points all along the way where we're either treatment to eliminate the, the agent or um, vaccines that can, um, that can um, uh, you know, prevent these, these various transitions can, can prevent the progression of cancer. And there's also an opportunity for identifying people that are at risk for cancer um, with, with cancer diagnostics. And so that's why you know, studying an infectious cancer is, is, is so appealing. Oh, and here we got antibiotics to, to cure some form of stomach cancers. Um, which this is an this is an interesting um, thing that I'll get back to to later. So um, so Helicobacter pylori specifically. Um, so this bacteria is is actually it turns out to be actually quite a common infection as is illustrated by this map, which shows the prevalence of infection in various parts of of the world. So it's estimated that actually half of the world's population carries this organism um, in their stomach. The mechanism of transmission is actually not fully resolved. So H. pylori thrives in the stomach, but actually not very well in the lower GI tract, but it's assumed it has to be some kind of um, uh, gastro-oral or fecal-oral um, transmission. And one of the interesting things about transmission is that strains are actually tend to be shared within families. Now, only a subset of those colonized will get disease. And, um, and that's really one of the big mysteries of H. pylori pathogenesis is that that's this interplay of bacterial genetics, host genetics, and environmental exposures that determines which people that carry this bacterium will get which disease. And as you can see here, there's actually more than one chronic disease associated with H. pylori. So um, uh, duodenal ulcers are actually the most frequent sort of um, bad outcome to come from H. pylori infection. So we don't unfortunately have any vaccines, but eradication with antibiotics can cure and prevent ulcers. And it actually um, prevents recurrence of cancer and progression of preneoplastic lesions. So antibiotic treatment is, is tough, you know, partly just because of where the bacteria live in, in the stomach. And so with the, the pH that actually inactivates antibiotics, which is why you have to take high doses in a long course. And then there's also um, the bacteria have become increasingly antibiotic resistant. Nina, could you um, clarify what you mean by preneoplastic lesions? Sure. So, um, uh, so it turns out that um, uh, cancer in the stomach, similar to cancer actually in the, in the colon as well, arises from um, progressive tissue changes. So from a normal looking stomach, it doesn't just go straight to cancer. There are actually precancerous changes that you see along the way. You also see this in cervical cancer. So um, where um, there are um, precursor lesions that can be detected by in, on pap smears, for example, that are precancerous, but then put you at much higher risk of, of getting cancer if you have those precancerous lesions. Great, thanks. So, um, so what, what are we doing in my lab? And um, in, in my lab, we've really been interested sort of in, in, the, in the very earliest step of the, the cascade, because we know that, um, that you know, since H. pylori infection is the biggest risk factor for getting gastric cancer, um, if we can understand how this bacteria can even colonize and stay in the stomach, this, this might um, uh, get us uh, uh, at a long way of understanding how then, then you get at this pathogenesis. So a lot of what we do has actually been just trying to understand using a mouse uh, uh, model to understand what allows this bacteria to colonize the stomach. And then we're also interested in how H. pylori um, uh, induces an immune response because um, it turns out that there's, there's an interesting yin, yin and yang here where H. pylori actually activates the immune system, but it, it activates it in this sort of manipulative way to both allow it to persist, um, but also to cause some of the pathology that then leads to these um, uh, cancerous changes. Now, interestingly, as part of our work to um, define the genes that, um, that, that allow the bacteria to infect the cell, we kind of got on this whole side project that I'm gonna talk about a little bit further in that 
Helicobacter pylori has this very interesting morphology and several of the genes that we identified as important for infection affect morphology. Um, another thing that we've, be, we've been, that kind of, that came out of our colonization screen is that it turns out another thing that's important for this bacteria to persist for decades in the stomach is its ability to modify its genome over time through a bunch of different mechanisms, mutation, recombination, phase variation, and even natural transformation. So it can take DNA up from its environment and sort of change during infection. And then um, uh, while I started my lab really focusing on this initial step of how um, the bacteria can even colonize the stomach in the first place, more recently we've been really interested in how this chronic infection leads to these um, pre-neoplastic um, uh, uh, tissue changes. So, um, so these metaplasias and these cell state reprogramming that, that, lead, that actually leads to cancer. And this is kind of interesting because people used to think that, that really you know, H. pylori was, was just about inducing inflammation and maybe less important for these later stages. But our more recent work is really focusing that H. pylori has, has specific roles in, in interacting with this metaplasia. So, um, so in, in looking at um, uh, these colonization screens, the way that we actually did this was to build these mutant libraries of, of, of H. pylori strains where each strain is, is mutated in a different gene. And then we use molecular biology methods to, whoops, to track um, uh, the bacteria um, behave after we infect them. So we're actually looking for mutants that don't colonize, so they're missing here. And for some reason, I'm going just ahead. Um, willy-nilly um, uh, out. So that's how we kind of did our initial screens. But one of the things that we found was a lot of the genes that we identified, we had no idea what, what they were doing. And um, in the meantime, I had a really serendipitous uh, interaction at, um, an, uh, at this Pew Charitable Trust meeting. So I had an early investigator award from the Pew Charitable Trust and I met this really fantastic woman, Christine Jacobs Wagner, who at the time was at Yale. Now she's at Stanford. And she was studying another bacterium called Colobacter crescentin, which lives in the, in the water. And it has a curved shape, which is not exactly like Helicobacter's helical shape, but she had identified genes that were important for that. And she was wondering if maybe some of those same genes um, might, um, might be at work in, in Helicobacter as well. And so I had um, this really great graduate student that decided to pursue this and to see if any genes that regulated cell shape might also regulate virulence. And that was um, uh, Laura Secura, who was an, a, one of an MCB graduate student. And basically what Laura did was, um, was that she isolated a bunch of different mutants um, using some similar methodology to, to what um, uh, Christine had done in her bacterium that all had non-helical shapes. So either they were straight or they were um, curved, but not helical, or even had you know, these very pleomorphic shapes. And it turned out that some of these mutants that Laura found in her shape screen, we also had found in our mouse colonization screen. So we were able to take these, these mystery genes and now give them a phenotype. But, and then, one of the other things that, you know, as, as Laura was starting this work was like, how do we actually quantify these different shapes? And here again, um, we ended up initiating this really great collaboration because of the Hal Weintraub Award. And so Hal Weintraub was one of the founders of the Basic Sciences Division at the Hutch, who sadly um, died young from um, glioblastoma. And there's a graduate student award that, um, that was developed in his name. And one of the awardees in 2007 was this, this gentleman, Zach Pincus from Julie Thiriel lab at Stanford, who actually, Julie's actually now in the Department of Biology here at University of Washington. And, um, and he helped us develop this, this, um, this software package to quantify cell shape, where we can take light images, threshold them, derive cell outlines, and then um, basically make these plots where we can plot individual bacteria and measure their, their length, their curvature, and we can segregate um, uh, different, 
different populations. So we can really, whoa, now I'm going ahead again. So that, that has been really great to allow us to, 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 to kind of characterize all these different mutants. And then we've had some really great um, interactions with a local biotech company um, with, um, it was originally, um, um, oh, I can't remember, they were acquired by Beck and Dick, Dickinson, but um, um, to, to actually use flow cytometry to identify more cell-shaped mutants because we discovered that um, our cell-shaped mutants actually scatter light differently in, a, in a, um, a, a flow cytometer. So normally people use these to sort out, you know, um, immune cell populations by fluorescence staining, but just using light scattering, we could distinguish our different, different mutants. And, um, and this was work of a postdoc and an undergrad um, in the lab. And then um, we've also really been interested, okay, now that we have these cell-shaped mutants and we know that they don't infect well, why is it that they don't infect well? And so this has been a really great collaboration with a biophysicist at Boston University and her graduate student, um, uh, Joe, and another graduate student of mine, Laura, where we actually um, uh, can take movies of Helicobacter swimming um, in um, viscous media like mucin um, and, and to see whether, whether cell shape affects the ability of the bacteria to, to swim, which was the major hypothesis in the field. And, and I'll just say that the, the short answer is, is that we do see, see effects on swimming speeds, but, but, but we think that that's not the whole story. And then, um, you know, sort of at a more biophysical level, we've identified all these genes that, that promote cell shape, but exactly how do they do that? And so, um, uh, and so uh, Jenny Taylor, a graduate student that recently gener graduated, has been focusing on, you know, where these act in the cells and another graduate student really getting down um, to, the, to the molecules that are actually doing this and, and getting protein structures. And then, um, and then we've collaborated with a group up at um, University of British Columbia to take these, these crystal structures of, of proteins that we know modify the cell wall and design inhibitors to understand um, how these work. And, um, and so this is actually kind of a movie uh, of, of Helicobacter pylori growing when we add an inhibitor to one of our cell shape proteins. And you can see that over time, now the cells actually um, uh, straighten out. And this is exciting because, you know, the fact that we can inhibit this bacteria that causes cell shape, this, this provides an opportunity to see whether we can actually use that to disrupt the infectious process and whether that in fact could be um, possibly um, a, a new type of antibiotic um, that targets the cell wall in, in, a, in a different way from um, some of our known antibiotics like ampicillin that also target the cell wall. So anyway, so, um, so sort of this, the summary of, of, of this, this project is that, you know, that we know that H. pylori has this complex um, uh, cell shape program. And you know, sort of where we're going now is, is how does it work with the molecular details of that. And then, um, and then we also know that, that cell shape mutants don't infect well. And, and, and so we're really um, pursuing the why of that. And so you know, part of the answer relates to, to being able to swim through mucus, but, um, but we don't think that that's the whole story. And then, um, you know, along the way, we've, we've um, identified these inhibitors of, of cell shape proteins that could um, possibly become a new class of antibiotics. And I think, you know, the, the, the other thing that I've learned along this path is that, is that, you know, cool science really happens when you forge um, collaborations. And so, um, so this is a, a fairly recent picture of the group. Uh, everybody here is still is in the lab. And, um, and I kind of focus mostly for the science part of this on the, on the cell shape project, but, but, um, but whoops, we also have people studying um, the innate immune system. Ooh, and it just doesn't want to let me go. And then um, and the prenial plastic stuff that I mentioned before. So maybe I can escape out of that. And, um, open it up for questions. Feel free to um, put questions into the chat or you can um, unmute. I've tried to unmute you all, but 
You talked in the beginning about strains. Are those different from the mutants? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So, um, so uh, there are lots and lots of different H. pylori strains. In fact, there's so much genetic diversity out there that for a while people used to think that, that everybody had their own personal strain. And, um, and, and these, um, so then later work made, made it more clear that, that strains tend to be shared within families. But, um, but these different strains are different at, at, a, at a lot of different levels, both at the sort of sequence of individual genes, having a lot of polymorphisms, um, uh, and then even at the, at the carriage of genes. So H. pylori um, actually has a kind of small back, uh, genome for a bacteria. It's about 1.7 megabases and about 1,500 genes. And about 1,100 of those are shared among all strains of H. pylori. And then, um, then each strain has another, say, 400, 400 to 500 um, genes that are, that are um, not shared across all strains and have different subsets of, of them. So, um, so yeah, so, but in the lab, we tend to uh, pick one strain to work with and then make what we call our isogenic mutant where we're changing one gene at a time. Um, and, and so therefore we can really study that, the effect of that gene in isolation. Okay, thank you. Hello, this is Zachary. Hi, Zachary. I have a question. When you said that the exact mode of transmission was not known, are there studies on the matter? Are people yeah. researching it? Yes. Um, uh, um, yes and no. Um, uh, there, there have been a lot of attempts to try to culture H. pylori from, um, from fecal matter and to look at contaminated water sources as a potential mode of transmission, since that is the mode of transmission of a lot of gut pathogens. And they've largely been unsuccessful. Um, uh, actually, while I was still at Stanford during my postdoc, uh, there was a, a professor in the um, infectious disease department that did a study where they recruited uh, people that were infected with H. pylori and they, um, they collected spit and they induced vomiting and they, um, they actually gave them um, uh, 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 medicine to make, make them kind of have diarrhea so that you'd have faster transit time through the GI tract to see whether um, that might be a, a possible route of transmission because there have been some epidemiology studies that suggested that maybe during diarrheal outbreaks you might have more transmission of H. pylori. Turns out H. pylori doesn't like alkali pH, which in the lower GI tract the, the pH is higher than, um, than it is in the stomach. But anyway, um, so in, in this, this study from Julie Parsonet, which she actually found was the, the best way to culture H. pylori from these um, individuals was actually from um, aerosols that were con collected next to vomit. So they induce somebody to vomit and um, not from the vomit itself, but from the aerosols next to the vomit was the best um, way to culture H. pylori. So um, in terms of the risk factors for catching H. pylori, usually you get it from family members, usually early in life, Large family size and low socioeconomic status are um, uh, major risk factors for, for having higher rates of infection. So oh, you said, oh, oh go, go ahead, Zachary. What? Go Please ahead, go ahead Zachary. Okay. You said it resides largely in the intestines. Does it go anywhere else in the body during its life cycle? So H. pylori actually lives in the stomach oh. um, primarily, but, um, but, but the GI tract is generally a one-way street. So, um, so even though it's mostly living in the stomach, it, it is shed through the, through, you know, 
through the intestine and, and out the other end. And in fact, um, we have, we've spent a little bit of time um, developing methods to, to detect it in stool. So, so, I mean, part of the problem for H. pylori is that we have so many other bacteria that thrive in the lower GI tract, particularly in the colon. So our colons are full of, you know, thousands and thousands of bacteria that help us digest our food and make, um, make uh, vitamins, et cetera, et cetera. And so H. pylori is swamped out there. So when people do um, uh, surveys of the fecal microbiome and they, you know, they amplify up nucleic acids and sequence to find out what bacteria are living in your intestines, you generally don't see H. pylori. But if we use really sensitive methods, um, uh, we actually can detect H. pylori. And that is actually a way to, uh, um, to be able to track, to track the infection non-invasively. Transmission issue that, that you brought up, oscopy, where you put a tube down somebody's, uh, the, the bacteria. But, um, you know, doing an epidemiologic study, that's just not practical. But by using um, the, this fecal test, uh, that, that represents a possibility to be able to do that. We have two questions in the chat. How do we know that H. pylori causes cancer given that it's so common and only causes problems in one in 70 people? And then what is being done related to the raised incidence in families? Are there genetic studies being done? Yeah. So, um, uh, so for the, the, the first one, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's been a bit tricky. So probably the, the best evidence uh, for this, so, so there was a lot of epidemiologic evidence that was, that was um, uh, accrued. Um, some of which actually was led by John Potter, who used to be the, the head of the Public Health Sciences Division here at um, Fred Hutch. Um, uh, actually, while well, he was still at University of Minnesota. But, um, uh, and, and that, that, that evidence was strong enough, the association of, you know, that, that people that had H. pylori infection got gastric cancer and those that, you know, those, those that didn't have cancer tend to have less H. pylori infection to get it um, declared a carcinogen in 1994. But then in 2001, a prospective study was done actually in Hawaii, where they um, studied um, Japanese Americans uh, a cohort and uh, basically looked, followed people that had H. pylori infection and, and those that did not. And, and basically they followed them over 10 years and found that, um, that the people with H. pylori infection started getting gastric cancer, whereas nobody in the H. pylori negative group did. So that was kind of the, the best kind of prospective study. And then since that time, we've learned, and this gets a little bit into the second question, about um, uh, genet both host and bacterial genetic risk factors for um, getting cancer in um, the context of H. pylori infection. And so um, there's been a couple of polymorphisms in immune genes um, particularly genes that cause higher levels of inflammation um, that put you at higher risk for getting gastric cancer um, if only if you have H. pylori infection. And then there's also some bacterial strain differences. So um, carriage of this pathogenicity island. So this is in these, um, you know, not the core genes, but these accessory genes that I mentioned earlier that are variably present across strains. There's, there's this pathogenicity island and specifically a gene called CAG-A. And so if you have CAG-A and you have the bad um, IL-1 beta polymorphism, your risk for getting gastric cancer um, you know, goes through the roof. Your odds ratio goes up by like 130. So to me, that synergism between both the host and the bacterial factors is kind of a, a, another, um, you know, Piece of evidence. And then I would say the third piece of evidence actually um, comes from um, 
uh, more recent data out of Japan and Korea. So those are countries that have very high incidence of gastric cancer to the point that they actually have screening. So just like here, um, uh, you know, once you're 50, you have to get a colonoscopy to start um, looking for early detection of um, colorectal cancer. There you actually have to get an upper GI endoscopy to look for early evidence of gastric cancer. And what they found is that if they detect these early gastric cancers that they can actually remove with the endoscope, um, if you have H. pylori infection at that time and you treat the H. pylori infection, those people then don't get a second cancer, whereas people that aren't, don't eradicate their H. pylori infection, either because they, they aren't treated or they have antibiotic resistance, um, they um, actually get um, recurrent cancer. So I think that answered both of those questions. Oh, and then there was the thing about um, transmission between family members. Um, uh, so we know that that's happening because of looking at, the, at, the, at the, the strain differences. And so we can tell if somebody's infected with a similar strain or a different strain. Um, and definitely if, if one family member has had cancer, then they are um, more, more, other family members are, are, are definitely at higher risk for getting um, uh, gastric cancer. And so they would be um, uh, suggested to be treated. So, um, so then there's the question about ulcers and cancer. And th that's actually really interesting because um, there, some of the risk fact, the bacterial um, uh, virulence genes that are associated with cancer are also associated with ulcer. Um, but there's also some differences in, in that people that particularly get duodenal ulcer are actually less likely to, to get um, gastric cancer than people that get gastric ulcer. And that partly has to do with where the bacteria go in, in the stomach. And so sort of the interaction with, with the bacteria and the tissue is, is different. So H. pylori can tolerate acid but it actually doesn't particularly like acid. So often when it, when it first infects, it goes to the bottom part of the stomach, which is called the antrum, kind of right near the, the um, junction with the, um, the small intestine. And when it infects there, it actually um, produces cytokines, some of which lead to higher levels of, of acid production. And when you have these really high levels of acid production, that puts you at risk for getting a duodenal ulcer. So the acids basically start spilling into the intestine and causes an ulcer. Now, if the bacteria and the associated inflammation move up into the main body of the, of the stomach, which is where the acid secretion happens by the parietal cells, there aren't any parietal cells in the antrum or very few. Um, somehow, by a mechanism that we don't understand that, that is probably related to the inflammation, um, the, you can start losing parietal cells in the, in the main body of the stomach. And then the, actually the stomach pH goes up. So you're at less risk for getting an ulcer, but now you're at higher risk for getting gastric cancer. And that's some of what we're trying to model um, in, in our sort of neoplastic model and how H. pylori interacts with those tissues to cause these changes. Ooh, question about the normal microbiome in the stomach. That's a super good question because, um, you know, before H. pylori was discovered, people used to think that there were no bacteria in the stomach. Um, and then when H. pylori was discovered, people were like, oh, there's H. pylori in the stomach. But even like, you know, lots of scientists and, and, and physicians that I've talked to, you know, even fairly recently often think that H. pylori is the only bacterium that's in the stomach, but that is actually not the case. There are other bacteria in the stomach. H. pylori is interesting in that when it's present, it tends to be numerically dominant. So as in like, you know, 99.9% .9 of the bacteria um, would be H. pylori, and that, but there still all are other bacteria there. And, um, and, and people are starting to, to look into what happens when H. pylori is not there um, 
uh, and how that changes. And, and then one of the other things that can happen is when you get these long-term tissue changes that I mentioned, where you lose the parietal cells and the stomach pH goes up, then it's much more likely that you get outgrowth of bacteria from the mouth in the stomach that, that norm, normally wouldn't live there. But now that the pH is, has become more neutral, now can set up shop in the stomach. And we actually wonder if some of those oral bacteria could be also contributing to gastric cancers. There's some ideas that some of the oral bacteria can metabolize um, uh, nitroso compounds that you have in your diet, and that that could be leading to mutations and, and cause, you know, helping contribute to gastric cancer. And then also there's this bacterium called Fusobacterium nucleatum, which has been recently implicated in colorectal cancer. And we wonder if it might actually be, could also be doing something in gastric cancer in the stomach as well. So it might be that it's more than just H. pylori that's causing um, cancer. What fraction of um, gastric cancers are actually due to H. pylori? So it's estimated that, that um, more than 80% of gastric cancer is associated with um, Helicobacter pylori infection. There are familial mutations in a gene called E. cadherin, which is a protein that helps um, cells uh, make it make tight connections with their neighbors in the, in the epithelium that causes a, a type of gastric cancer called diffuse gastric cancer. That accounts in the US, it accounts for maybe six to nine percent of gastric cancer. Um, interestingly, H. pylori can be associated with those cancers as well, but, but doesn't have to be. So you can get that kind of cancer without H. pylori infection. Um, uh, but only about one to two percent of people carry H. pylori infection will get gastric cancer. And you cannot always detect H. pylori infection at the time of cancer diagnosis. So sometimes by the time you get the cancer, the H. pylori is gone, but it has been there. And in fact, in some of the early epidemiology studies, they actually um, uh, used uh, serology, so antibodies against H. pylori to, to, look, to de define that association. And they actually found that if they used banked serum from 10 years prior, they got a stronger association. And that sort of was kind of went with this idea that maybe by the time that you got get cancer, your infection had, had waned, and so therefore your antibodies would have waned as well. But, but clearly some people still have H. pylori at the time of gastric cancer, because I, I mentioned the studies in, in Japan and Korea where if at the time they detect the early cancer, if they treat your H. pylori, then that prevents the, the second cancer. Did I miss any other questions? I think there's been a lot of, um, you know, kind of a, uh, thinking in the general public, uh, more so in the past, but still uh, today about uh, ulcers being caused primarily by stress versus bacteria. Could you address that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, there was actually a lot of resistance to the discovery of H. pylori um, uh, from the medical community even uh, because they, they felt that they understood how H. pylori, uh, sorry, how ulcers are caused by this hyper um, acid secretion. And they also had good medications to deal with this, so proton pump inhibitors. And, you know, from a drug company's perspective, they're kind of the perfect drug because when you go on them, you have to stay on them for, you know, essentially the rest of your, your life. And so when, um, when a pylori was discovered um, and uh, the, this, these doctors in Australia, uh, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, who, um, who made this discovery were saying that you could just treat with antibiotics and, and cure ulcers that there was a lot of skepticism about that. Um, and um, but you know, um, and and basically, it wasn't until there were clinical trials where they they gave you know the the proton pump inhibitors and an antibiotics 
um, and show that that really could cause um, a regression of the ulcers and, and prevent recurrence compared to just the, the, the proton pump inhibitors alone that really established H. pylori as a causal agent of, of ulcers. But as I mentioned, even for ulcers, you know, only maybe 10 to 20% of people infected will get ulcers. And so there's, there's something about the host pathogen interaction that tips the balance to a, a, you know, a higher amount of inflammation that leads to these adverse outcomes. And, um, and it is likely that stress and diet you know, feed into how, how this, this interaction um, happens. We don't have a great way of, of, of quantifying that fully. It's, it, I think it's pretty clear that in a, in a number of immune-mediated um, diseases that, that stress does play a role. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, Tim was asking, do you need any special BSL like uh, level to work with H. pylori? And are there any practical uses of H. pylori in a high school classroom? Yeah. So um, uh, we do have to work with this organism under BSL 2, biosafety level 2 conditions, because it is a human pathogen. Um, the other thing that, that's tricky about it is that it is, um, it is microaerophilic. So, um, so it does not like room um, air. It's, that's a little too much oxygen for it. Um, it turns out compared to other microaerophilic organisms, H. pylori is not as oxygen sensitive as some. And the other thing is, is that it's capnophilic. So it loves carbon dioxide. So, um, so we either grow it in a 14% CO2 incubator or a tri-gas incubator where we, um, where we give 10% um, CO2. And, and we do 10% oxygen. A lot of people, sort of standard microaerophilic conditions would be 5% oxygen, but H. pylori will tolerate the higher oxygen. And I just, because we have to have a nitrogen tank to, to, to bring the oxygen tension down. And so that way we just burn through less nitrogen. So it's because I'm cheap um, that we grow it under that, those conditions and, and, then, and then they still grow well. But, but it's sort of the fact that H. pylori doesn't really like room air works a little bit to our advantage. But H. pylori is pretty fastidious. So um, you know, if you leave it out on the bench, it'll die. So we don't have to be as careful as for some enteric pathogens um, like, you know, for example, I mean, if you're, if you're working with Shigella, you have to be super careful because the infectious dose is like two bacteria. But oh. um, in all my years, knock on wood, I've never infected myself nor had anybody in the lab um, uh, get, get experiment, you know, get, have, have, have infection. So, so we're, we're careful. We, we wear gloves and, and, you know, if we're working with really high volumes, we would work in that biosafety hood, but we actually can work with it on the bench. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. So if you could um, uh, leave comments in the chat or um, on, you can turn your video on and wave. Uh, if you could turn your screen over um, to me again. How do I, I do I have that? One, I, I have one that. more. You just stop sharing. And um, I'll oh, put okay, up my last go. slide there to kind go. of, Sorry. yeah, no worries. And I'll uh, queue up my last slide here. Um, Hi, Zachary. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> and uh, hope that we see you all next time. Um, I don't know if can... you can tell, but I'm hunching over in my chair. And this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, that next week we have Dr. Julie Overbaugh, another faculty member from Fred Hutch. Um, professor of Human Biology and Public Health Sciences is going to talk about international collaborations, um, an example from studies of HIV infection of infants. So kind of continuing that theme of collaboration. And then a reminder for teachers about our uh, professional development workshop next week. If you're interested in that, please let us know. And the feedback form, um, there is a link there. And um, we can uh, also drop that into the chat for you in a minute and um, hope to see you all again soon. Uh, we've decided to um, keep Hutch at home going through the summer at least and maybe even into the fall. So we've got some great, great speakers who are already lining up for um, upcoming 
upcoming talks. So I hope you've been enjoying this series and we're so glad that you joined us today. And uh, thanks again to Dr. Salama for spending time with us.